Understand me without a microphone. Yes. We don't need a microphone. It's nice to speak without a microphone simply because I always feel that that imposes a curtain between me and the people that I'm talking to. <clears throat> You're here to see a Celtic instrument and I've just played a trombone. Why did I just play a trombone? because I am a trombonist, quite obviously. That is my primary skill. I am a modern trombone player. I play orchestral, jazz, contemporary and early music. That is how I came to be involved with the reconstruction of this instrument. This instrument is the Deskford Carnix. We call it the Deskford Carnix because it was discovered in the small hamlet of Deskford on the shores of the Moray Firth in northeast Scotland. It was discovered in 1816 when men were digging a field drain to drain the land. It was in a peat bog. This instrument is an ancestor of this instrument. It is of a type. This type of instrument is a lip reed instrument. Now, anybody who knows about wind instruments knows that reed instruments include saxophones, clarinets, oboes, bassoons. They have reeds which vibrate. This form of instrument, we use our lips to vibrate. That's how we make the sound. The trombone is one of the most archaic instruments that we still use in a modern orchestral or commercial situation. It's been almost unchanged for 500 years. It has no keys, it has no holes, it has no buttons. Fundamentally, it's a megaphone. A megaphone. It makes things louder. Rubbish goes in this end, more rubbish comes out, amplified. But all of it is basically... That. What is being created is a vibrating column of air in a tube. That is amplified and that is what creates the tone of this instrument. Why am I telling you all this? Because the act of reconstructing an instrument which is unknown in the contemporary world requires us to look for parallels. Parallels both in our own contemporary culture and in cultures which have disappeared. And in parallel cultures which are still active today. There's also can I just ask, a show of hands, how many people so far have been in to see the wonderful Celtic exhibition? Marvellous. Anybody who didn't put their hands up, please go, because it is quite simply the most superb and stunning assemblage of Celtic cultural artefacts that this country has ever seen in one place at one time. It is an unbelievable treasure. I have seen most of these things spread around Europe. I've never seen them all together, ever. And so it's a wonderful privilege to be here to talk to you tonight in this situation. This exhibition also concerns Celtic cultural identity. On the opening night of this exhibition, the person who gave the address was Jeremy Paxman wonderful television journalist. He was, of course, 
asked to do that because of his wonderful rapier wit and because he is a master of debunking nonsense. He has a bullshit radar, radar attached to his head. So any sort of woolly thinking, he smells it out and he hones in on it and he napalm bombs it. And that was absolutely wonderful. And notwithstanding the fact that many of my Irish, Scottish, Welsh friends, I was standing next to a group of Druids, as a matter of fact, at that reception. Notwithstanding the fact that many of them were wilting a little under his rapier wit, nonetheless, there is undoubtedly an enormous and rich identity attached to that word Celtic. And almost everybody in this space will be aware of it and feel it and relate to it somehow. And it's alive today as it has been for three and a half thousand years. Before I dispense with my trombone, I want to say something about the essential nature of these instruments. I've just shown you that they vibrate air column with lips. The thing that we all have in our body that vibrates an air column is our vocal cords. My vocal cords produce the same note with the same reflex and the same air column. When I play this instrument, the instrument stands in for my body, this bell stands in for my head, and my lips stand in for my vocal cords. So this instrument is a super voice. It actually makes the sound of a male human voice, but more powerfully, more penetratingly, and more trajected than a human voice can be. And that has coloured the entire history of these instruments. I would just quickly like to play for you something of a Celtic source, very, very in ancient, far more ancient than this trombone, but younger than this instrument and many thousands of years younger than the next instrument I'm going to play you. This is a chant from the earliest Christian times. It's called Benedicamus Domino. And this chant was first recorded in the early 4th century, and it is almost certainly of Coptic origin. That is, it is from the earliest desert Christian existence, where Judaism morphed into Christianity. And I'm then going to play you what we call a trope. A trope is a written improvisation, and it was written by a Scottish monk working on the little island of Inchcombe in the Firth of Forth, in the abbey on that Iona of the South, in the Firth of Forth. And it was written down in the 9th century and it is based upon that ancient song, and it clearly shows, I hope you will agree, a Celtic sensibility in religious music, and it is completely distinct from anything that was being written in mainland Europe at the time. Here's the plain chart. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
This is another important thing to note. This family of instruments comes from the period of human existence that we denote hunter-gatherer. All of these instruments, these lip-read instruments, are created out of natural materials originally. They are horns, literally horns. They are shells. This is a very big fish supper. That's a lot of eating. And they are hollowed branches, for instance, the didgeridoo of Australia, which actually contains, in its natural form, a very delicious, apparently, and nutritious insect, a termite, which is very sustaining to those who eat them. And in the process of gathering those termites, it was discovered that that hollowed branch was also a log drum and a wooden trumpet. People gathered at these fish all around the warm littorals of the sea as human beings walked out of Africa and spread around the world. When you have extracted the fish, in order to get the best out of it, you must wear a hole into the shell. If you smash the shell, the fish is full of sharp shards. And when you've done that and you get the lovely gravy in the bottom, you discover it's a megaphone. A megaphone. It makes things louder, much louder. This is a natural megaphone. It has a conchoidal shape, a conch. We've got them in our ears, our cochlear. That shape amplifies sound inside our heads. That's how we hear. And human beings discovered very early that you could communicate by shouting, singing through these instruments, these shells, a beautiful nature object, also an instrument. And still, in, on Bali, for instance, you will find a male voice form of chanting, singing, called kechak, where you have maybe 30 men sitting round together, chanting with rhythmic pulses. Jack, 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 kechak, kechak, jack, 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 jack. One man the shell, the voice of a monkey spirit, converting his voice into something else. Perhaps something like this. Which really doesn't sound like my voice at all. It's a natural form of voice transformation. These days we do that digitally. But you don't need a digital transformer to transform your voice. A large shell would do it for you. If, however, you buzz your lips into this in the way that I did on the trombone, it becomes the most extraordinarily beautiful and penetrating horn. If you have ever watched a modern French horn player playing, you know that the right hand of the player is stuck into the bell. You may have wondered why. It's because it affects the tone quality and the pitch of the instrument because it changes the interior cavity of the instrument. What would happen if I put my hand into the shell and change its volume, air volume? has an enormous variety of tone colour to play with.
very archaic instrument. It has been a form of money for many hundreds of thousands of years because they are so beautiful. And it has been a source of food and it has been a source of sound creation and manipulation. And now on to what you thought you were going to see. This instrument is a carnyx. Now, we used to say it was the carnyx, because until very recently, this one and the one that is displayed in the exhibition were the only two functioning examples of the carnyx in the modern world. It's an instrument which was depicted on stones, stone reliefs, coins, throughout the Gratio Roman world from around about 300 BC until approximately the fall of the Roman Empire. These instruments were made by people of Celtic culture and we must remember that Celtic culture is a pan-European phenomenon. It is not a bloodline, we now believe. This is still a contested issue, but there are many genetic types which adopted Celtic culture. But wherever that culture existed, it would appear that these great instruments were made. Quite clearly, this represents something from nature. It's an instrument with a head. It's the head of a sanglier, it's the head of a wild boar. It's the animal that Obelix loved to eat. And that was so important to all people living in the densely wooded climes of northern Europe. The wild boar was so important in so many ways. It was good to eat, it was very intelligent, very fast, very strong. The British wild boar was hunted to extinction quite a long time ago, but we know that it was distinct from the European wild boar, and we know one or two other things about it. For instance, that it could outrun a horse. For instance, that it had venomous saliva. For instance, that it could remove a man's arm with one bite. So if you were capable of bringing one of these things down, you were not only bringing in the bacon, you would also proved you were quite a man, quite a warrior. They therefore became symbolic of masculine power. They were totemic. They represented the soul, the strength of people, of tribes. Indeed, in one of the most ancient of the Scottish clans, which likes to trace its origins to the Picti, to the Picts, the MacKinnon clan of the northeast of Scotland, the wild boar is still the crest animal. And it has been the crest animal since well before the period at which the Scots overcame the pits and absorbed them. So, this instrument was made by proto-Pictish people approximately the time of Christ, just before, just afterwards. It was deposited in a peat bog, but it wasn't lost. It was sacrificed. It was ritually dismembered. It was a propitiation. We do not know why. But we can say that in a lochen with a cranog, that is a man-made island in a lake, a sacred water site, over a period of about 200 years, there had been many sacrifices and this musical instrument was the most fabulous of them. So quite obviously, the instrument had been in use for a long time and it was considered to be very important. Therefore, to sacrifice it was a major act of propitiation. What was discovered, you will see in a cabinet in the exhibition, simply the head. The head is very complex as an object. It has a movable jaw, and the jaw was still totally intact when it was discovered. It has a tongue of wood mounted on a bronze leaf spring in its throat. That also was still there when it was discovered. It has a soft palate which is reached. 
If you rub your tongue over the roof of your mouth, please do it. You can feel the vestigial ridges on the roof of your own mouth. That is because in the process of becoming human beings, we have passed through a ruminative stage. We have passed through a stage when we needed to digest rough vegetable matter. And those ridges are still there. But there's another thing you can feel on the roof of your mouth. You can feel a line that goes right back towards the soft palate. And that line is where your head and my head are joined. And it goes right up through our head. And at the top, our skull is joined. Because the mammalian skull, and particularly the great apes and us, our head must be compressed at the time of birth to get through the birth canal, the mother's pelvis. And we have fontanelles. Those fontanelles are the leaves of bone which join our skulls. And ladies and gentlemen, this animal has fontanelles. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. It's something which has escaped many people that look at it. In fact, this head is made of sheet bronze, hammered for well over 400 hours from ingot. And it's of different grades of bronze, which approximate different weights of bone in a real mammalian skull. Inside the head, there's a resonating chamber above the soft palate. So it's unlike my trombone. It's unlike the shell. It's actually unlike any other lip reed instrument. And there are hundreds of them. Because this instrument has a head. And this head is hot when it is played. It is radiating sound all around, not just out of its mouth. And actually, we do the same. Mm. I don't need to open my mouth to project my voice. Mm. Because this is vibrating, this is vibrating, this is vibrating. This is vibrating. Any actor knows how to project their voice. So this instrument is a head on a pole. And probably its first instance was a head on a pole. Maybe it was a human head on a pole. Because many people of Celtic culture had a head cult. They hung skulls from the bases of their chariots. They drank wine from the skulls of their enemies. And they loved decapitation. But this head is their totemic animal. And it's definitely male, because here you see a crest. We call that hackles. You know when you say, my hackles rose? That's because we also have the vestigial hackles of our relative, the pig. Some are more related than others. <laughs> and when we're scared, they rise. So this animal is either scared or angry or looking for Miss Piggy. <laughs> but it is most definitely in a state of arousal. Its playing position is this. Therefore, it is the tallest instrument that any culture has produced. That instrument can carry above the heads of mounted horsemen or charioteers. And most certainly, this was a military culture, a warrior culture. They didn't have standing armies, but their prized martial arts, if you like, were a fundamental part of their culture. And this instrument was present at major battles in historic times. The word carnix, it's very appropriate to be here, because the word carnix is Greek. Actually, no, it isn't. It is older than Greek. It is a primordial North African absorbed into Indo-European word which actually has the same root as carnivore and the most Eastern incidence of it that I have found is an instrument which has many parallels. I only discovered of its existence recently. It's in Uzbekistan and it is called a Karnai. What an extraordinary coincidence. There is no other word in Uzbek that has any similar root. Therefore, the likelihood of that similarity applied to a musical instrument is so vanishingly remote that one must assume a cultural connection at some point after the fall of the Roman Empire. There was a diaspora of Celtic and other Germanic peoples 
at the time of the Falka Bandarung, the movement of peoples across Europe, they went where they could. They went where they could to fight, to trade, to start a new life, and to get away from the people that were driving them in front of them. If I play this instrument in the same way that I play the trombone, you'll hear it's very loud. very powerful instrument. However, there is a convention, there is a certain conservatism in archaeological circles which derives from received knowledge. We hugely respect our Greek and Roman sources. Whenever Greek and Roman or greater Roman people met this instrument, it was in the hands of enemy people. They loved to glorify their enemies, particularly their military prowess, to show how clever they were by having wiped them out. We still tend to do that today. The noble savage. So, this instrument is reflected in triumphal arches, frequently, on coins, Gratio Roman coins, Brit Gallo Roman coins, many in Britain. Normally, however, it's shown reduced in size, or upside down, or broken, or trampled underfoot. There is only one Celtic representation of this instrument in plain position. It is the only proof that we have of any method of playing the instrument, and that proof is here in the museum right now. And it is called the Gundestrup Cauldron. It is a magnificent ritual cauldron, silver, and is covered in repoussé work, hammered and traced metalwork. And there are three Carnix players. And those three Carnix players are all holding this Carnix aloft. Therefore, we know that that particular culture, and it is not Scandinavian, we think it is Scythian, I believe. We certainly think it is Eastern, from the Eastern part of Europe. And it was raided by the Vikings, taken and buried in Gundestrup. Denmark, but it's not Viking. However, recent discoveries in France and Italy have cast a totally new light on this instrument, because in Tantignac and San Zeno, Tantignac in the Corrèze of France and uh, uh, San Zeno in Fr uh, Italy, Préalp, there have been two carnices discovered, one of which was almost complete, and in Tantignac, six of them. And I actually am honoured to have the first reconstruction of that instrument in Scotland right now, and I'm going to be playing it in Rome um, in two weeks' time. Now, that instrument, however, is not played like this instrument. It doesn't look like this instrument, apart from the fact that it has a head, but it has, instead, it has a straight magpie. This shape. And in fact, if I show you this, this is the mag this is the magpipe in gold <coughs> and silver of the Tantignac Carnix. This means that that instrument could not be played like the Tantignac Carnix, uh, like the Desperate Carnix. If I put a straight magpipe onto this, I could make the same sound. Okay, same sound. However, quite clearly, there is a big problem if I want to play it straight up. There's only one way I can do it. <laughs> Which is not very effective for a war instrument. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's your name? Freya. Freya, would you stand up for me? Because I really need some help. Now, I'm going to kneel down. If you come and look at the people here, Turn around. Now I'm going to put no, this way. That's brilliant. Now you put your arm up and hold Mr. Carnex. Okay. Now I'm going to come down behind you and I'm going to play it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
thank you. Give her a round of applause, please. Thank you very much. Now, what did that do to you? What did that do to you? That gave you a completely different impression of this instrument. Suddenly, it iconographically, it physically means something totally different. I played it differently, yes, I played it gently. But I can process with it, I can use it with another human being, and it looks at you, baby, uh. instead of shouting at you, mate. So what an instrument means in terms of its playing posture is radically different according to the playing posture and the position, especially if there's a head. I, over the years of playing this, and now it's quite a while, have come to, in myself, disbelieve the sobriquet war horn for this instrument. Most certainly it is capable of being played in a very warlike way, and I'm finally going to play it in that way as the last thing I do. But before I do that, I want to play it gently for you. I want to play it in a way, perhaps, that I, we could imagine it being used as a ritual or sacred instrument. Because actually, this instrument has an enormous dynamic range. I can play it louder than a trombone, but as quiet as an alto flute. That means it can play as quiet as the quietest modern orchestral instrument and louder than the loudest modern orchestral instrument. I have a range of nearly five octaves on it, which puts it at a greater range than just about any modern acoustic instrument. That is enormous, and this is the truth. It is a work of acoustic genius, and it was made by Woded Savages. Well, I think not. <laughs> So let me, let me play it for you in a slightly different way. This is a piece on an album. Incidentally, there are, I don't have any of them here, but you can go on the internet and buy them from Carnix & Co. website. Um, there are a lot of uh, CDs. There is music for this instrument with symphony orchestra, string quartet, jazz ensembles, percussion, electronics. It is an instrument which has been asleep for 2,000 years, but all you have to do to reawaken an instrument is to have an idea. Musical instruments are to express human ideas. Therefore, the reconstruction of a musical instrument is in a class utterly different to the reconstruction of any other archaeological object. If you reconstruct a cauldron, you are not going to make your family dinner in it. If you reconstruct a chariot, you're not going to work in it. If you reconstruct a toga, you're not going to go to the office in it. Well, not if you want to go to the office the next day anyway. <laughs> if you reconstruct a musical instrument, find out how it works and use it, it is as valid as the moment at which it was first used. Because music is timeless as well as being individual. It is a liquid commodity in time. So here's a little bit of something I wrote called The Cry of the Wolf.
thank you very much. Uh, I'm slightly constrained by time. I don't want to eat into somebody else's time. There are lots of wonderful things going on. The last piece I'm going to play is actually for five of these instruments. Of course, there's only me playing. The other four are pre-recorded. And my very good friend who helped me to make this piece nearly 20 years ago is sitting in the front row here, John Whiting, <laughs> one of the greatest sound designers that has ever worked in Britain. It's nice to have John here with me tonight. <laughs> This piece was recorded um, near midnight in the great echoing chamber, the atrium of the National Museum of Scotland, by kind permission and bribery of the, uh, the staff. And we recorded it sound on sound without any editing whatsoever. Uh, it's called The Voice of the Carnix. It is again the title track of an album. And it's the first piece in 2000 years written for the instrument. There are now an awful lot more. So, and uh, my friend James is going to assist me over here. Thank <laughs> you. 